The show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up in today's show, cakes and desserts just wouldn't be the same without it. We'll find out how sugar beets is turned into sugar. They spend their whole lives being walked on, but the humble doormat does a great job protecting your carpets. We'll find out how. And more miles for your money. Surely the car owner's dream. We'll learn more about the benefits of converting your car to run on liquid petrol gas. But first, rubber roasting. Tire smoking action is all part of the fun at a modern car rally, but at this rate the tires will go bald pretty quickly. But whether it's natural wear or deliberate destruction, you can still recycle them. One interesting solution is carpeting for cow sheds, but we'll find out more about that later. In one year alone, the British public scrapped over 40 million tires, but just over 10% of them were actually recycled. First, they're collected at state-of-the-art facilities like this one. The first step when recycling a tyre is to check its condition. Some still have some life in them. These can be sold on to dealers or shipped to other countries. However, if the tyre gets a red mark, it's beyond repair and must be destroyed. The sorting process is done by this machine, which used to sort mailbags at the post office. Now, instead of bags of letters, the camera scans tyres. If it spots any with red marks, they're sent to the pile to be destroyed. Tyres with any wear left in them can be recut or sold on. Where they will go depends on how worn they are. The sorting system identifies the right bin to put the tyre in and it's released to await its fate. Red mark means recycle only, but this is no easy task. The recycling plant can't just rip them apart. Modern tyres are made up of many elements, including rubber, steel bands and man-made fibres. There are a lot of different things there to deal with. The first stage of the recycling process is the shredder. Breaking the tyres down will help to separate the metal from the rubber. Tires that end up here certainly won't be rolling along the open road again. In the shredded pieces that emerge, you can clearly see the metal and fibres within the tyre, which still need to be separated out. To do this, the rubber and metal chunks must be ground down several more times until they're much, much smaller. This conveyor belt contains a powerful magnet. As it passes over the finer shreds, the steel is collected. The metal industry will pay good money for this abundant source of scrap. The magnet has removed most of the metal, but there's always some left over. The next machine shakes it up and then pours it across smaller magnets. The remaining fragments should be caught as the rubber passes through the grate. And this is what you're left with. Black gold. No, not oil but pure rubber. Every year, this facility can recycle 30,000 tons of old tires. One of the more ingenious uses for this recycled rubber, carpeting for cows. To make it, the rubber is heated to around 50 degrees Celsius. Too hot and it sticks together, too cold and it won't mix. It has to be right. New chemicals are mixed in that will help to create a firm and durable new rubber. Next, silicon is sprayed over the forms. This will stop the recycled rubber sticking to the pan. It's a bit like when you grease a cake tin. The machine will now measure out 50 kilos of the fresh rubber mix into each form. They're then fed into the ovens to cook at 150 degrees Celsius. The rubber melts together and takes on its new shape.
What emerges is a gigantic mat, similar to the type you might find in a school gymnasium for PE class. The workers strip off the edges to get the mats into the right shape, but what will they be used for? Well, it sounds unusual, but research shows that a comfortable environment improves milk productivity. These mats will be laid to soften the footing for dairy cattle. The mats need holes to help with drainage. These are cut using a very unusual knife. It doesn't use a metal blade. Instead, it uses water pressurized to almost four tons per square centimeter. It's incredibly powerful and slices through the fresh rubber with ease. The mats are now ready and just need to be installed. Like fitting carpet, the farmer lays them down before letting the cows back in. It's hoped that by easing the pressure on their hooves, hooves like these will be more comfortable and more productive. Apparently, comfy cows produce more milk. The more milk the cows produce, the more the farmer profits, so everyone benefits. Just one of the many new uses for old tyres transformed along the road of recycling. White granulated sugar. Britain eats more than 2 million tons of the stuff every year. Now, you may not believe this, but half of that is made in the UK using the humble sugar beet. Related to the popular purple beetroot, sugar beet starts out as a seed. They're coated with nutrients to improve growth and then planted. Eighty days later, and here's the result. The sugar beet plants are ripening steadily in the sun. Like any other green plant, the beet grows through the process of photosynthesis. Sunlight absorbed through the leaves is converted into chemical energy that produces glucose and oxygen. When the beets are grown, massive tractors harvest the crop. They pick it and prepare it all in one go. First, the leaves are removed. They are no use to sugar production, so they're sliced off. Now the beets themselves can be dug out of the ground to be collected into the harvester. As they follow the guiding tube into the machinery, they're forced up into the holding basket at the back. The harvesters can collect more than 25 tons of beet every hour. They're loaded up and sent on to the enormous processing plant. British farms produce almost 7 million tonnes of sugar beet every year. The soil in Lincolnshire and Essex is ideal for growing this useful vegetable. The sugar they produce will sweeten tea, coffee, cakes and desserts. However, before they will go anywhere near a cake or a cuppa, they need a good wash. What emerges from the other side is freshly scrubbed beet ready to be turned into granulated sugar. Next, the big lumpy vegetables need to be cut down into chips. They're not going to be fried, but this machine makes the pieces smaller so the natural sugars can be reached. Tons and tons of beet chips are passed into these enormous boilers, and the hot water gets to work. Cooking the chips helps release the elements from the beet into the water. These elements are what will be used to make the sugar with. The leftover chips aren't wasted. They are compressed into little nibble-sized pieces and used as pet food. Apparently, they're very popular with rabbits. Now, to make sugar, this sweet water is what the manufacturers want. But first, it needs to be cleaned. The water contains many elements which would ruin the final flavor. So lime water is added, which filters out the unwanted material. The pure sugar water passes through the filter and can now be refined. 
In this condition, it's not very thick and the sugar concentration is quite low. To sweeten it, the mixture is sent through six different boilers. As it passes through each one, more and more water is boiled off, leaving a thick, sweet syrup by the end. The sugar syrup is a dark brown colour and actually looks like frothy chocolate milk. It must now be boiled down again under very low pressure, and this final boiling process creates crystals within the liquid. This is the sugar we are all familiar with. The crystallised syrup is now spun in a centrifuge. The brown liquid passes out, leaving the white crystals behind, which can now be collected. Britain makes about half of its own sugar in this fashion. The other half is imported and is usually made from sugar cane instead. Most of this is grown in the Caribbean and Africa. To reach your teacup, the crystallized sugar must now be packaged up. The standard one kilogram bag is filled and packed down. Alternatively, you may prefer to use sugar cubes. Raw sugar is moistened and pressed into cube forms. As the conveyor belt moves forward, tiny plungers force the new cubes out. These cubes can now be collected in neat rows and placed into a box, ready to fill the sugar bowls in tea rooms all over Britain. So, thanks to the beetroot's cousin and a lot of hard work, you can now enjoy a hot, sweet cup of tea. to come. The doormat stands guard over your home, protecting your carpets from the outside world. What has this got to do with coconuts? And adapting your car to run an LPG is one alternative to petrol. We'll show you how simple it is to do after the break. Autumn. It's the perfect time of year for a nice walk in the park. But rain and mud mean that when you get home, the dirt and leaves stuck to your shoes may ruin your carpet. One brilliant solution comes from coconuts, or the coconut husk to be more precise. Coconut husk fibre, known as qua, is used to make doormats. Its antibacterial properties help to kill germs. It's absorbent, which traps water, and most importantly, it's tough, which helps remove unwanted dirt. Coconut fibre doormats start their lives here. Miles of the qua are woven into long threads which are kept on big spools. These reels feed the mat-making machine. It takes the fibre from six coconuts to make just one doormat, so the factory needs a plentiful supply. When a reel runs low, it's connected to another one to keep a continual feed to the machine. The worker must weave the reels together because any knots would jam the whole system. The mat machine sits like a big spider at the center of an enormous coconut thread web. 400 lines are fed simultaneously through these holes to form the basis for the doormats. Now, to make a mat using this coconut husk, the secret ingredient is glue. The fibrous threads aren't woven together, they all sit vertically on the mat. The glue is used as a foundation for the threads. First, this guillotine slices the fibres into the right lengths. These lengths then fall into the glue base waiting below. As the knife slices through the fiber, the shape of the funnel forces the pieces to fall vertically where they land in the waiting glue. In the case of this doormat, the fiber lengths are cut to about 16 millimeters, the perfect height for cleaning a pair of trainers or muddy hiking boots. 
the fibers are pressed to make sure they're seated firmly and the whole glue fiber combination is then passed over a large heating plate. This hardens the glue and seals the bristles into place. To keep quality up, the workers take regular samples from each roll of new doormat. The first test they must undergo is the strength test. Using a tension device and a pair of pliers, the worker will analyse how much pressure is needed to wrench the bristles free from the glue base. If the bristles survive more than 6 kilos of pressure, they've passed. The next test measures the mat's resilience. This robotic device looks like it's from a sci-fi film set, but it's not that sophisticated. Its job is to walk up and down continually. This simulates many hours of use and tests how durable the doormat is. And one of the most important qualities of the modern doormat is absorbency. To help stop mud and water coming into your home, it's important they can trap liquid effectively. No damp footprints mean the coconut fibre is doing its job well. With the quality assured, the doormats can now be cut into shape. First the rough edges are cut off and a haircut follows. Using a guillotine which looks like a lawnmower, this machine will trim the fibres down to a uniform length. Next comes the shape. Many mats can be cut from each new roll. The workers collect them up and they're sent on to the print department. Popular designs range from a big welcome sign to the colours of your favourite football team. The logos will be applied here. First, a layer of glue is laid down corresponding to the desired shape. This is then followed by several different layers of statically charged coloured flakes. The flakes stick to the glue and a picture eventually emerges. The static helps attract dirt from the user's shoes, so even the picture on the mat helps to keep your house clean. The final step is to clean the mats off. During the production process, plenty of dirt and fibres may have been caught and no one wants to buy a dirty mat. These machines dislodge anything that may be stuck in place. And finally, the mat is finished. So, having started life protecting the flesh of the coconut, the Kuala now protects your home from dirty shoes. The price of petrol is rising. It's getting so bad that some petrol pump bandits drive off without paying for it. Then there's the environment to consider. So what's the alternative? Well, last year more than 15,000 UK drivers converted their cars to run on LPG. Car producers in Germany are known for their gas guzzlers, but their attitudes are changing too. Liquid petrol gas gives the driver several benefits over normal petrol. At this small German garage, the conversion process begins with the addition of a new tank. It's installed in the spare tyre well. The mechanic cuts a hole in the bodywork. This is where the fuel line will travel from the tank to the engine. He takes care to smooth off any rough edges so nothing is damaged. The new tank can now be fitted into place with its opening through the freshly cut hole. A 
gas line is fitted into the mouth of the tank which includes a safety valve. Standards must be kept high when dealing with flammable fuels. The gas will flow down a pipe along the bottom of the car. It will eventually arrive here where another valve is being fitted. This valve connects the LPG system to the existing petrol system and must be securely attached. LPG gives you fewer miles per litre than petrol, but LPG is also around half the price, so the benefits are obvious. There's also a gas filter, similar to a standard petrol filter, and a pressure regulator to make sure nothing goes wrong. With everything in place, the mechanics can take the converted car out for a test drive. There are over 9 million LPG cars worldwide, and petrol stations are also converting to offer this cheaper fuel. In the UK, there are over 1,300 forecourts providing this environmentally friendly alternative. The filling process is much like feeding a standard petrol tank, the only difference being the nozzle is screwed into the fuel slot so nothing is spilt by accident. Like the car conversion, buses can also be transformed. The tanks are specially made like ordinary fuel tanks. And because LPG is a liquid, not gas, it doesn't need to be stored under high pressure. Driving around with a spare tank full of flammable gas might sound like a risky proposition, but extensive testing over the last 30 years has helped develop better storage facilities which can survive massive impacts quite safely. Even when the scientists tested these tanks in extreme conditions, they didn't prove any more dangerous than your ordinary petrol tank. Even when exposed to this test fire burning at over 1,000 degrees Celsius, and as the tanks aren't highly pressurized, the risk of explosions is also lower. There's one other useful benefit. Cheaper fuel is an obvious one, but by keeping two different fuel tanks, you can now travel further with fewer fuel stops. Here, the mechanics are testing that the LPG system is working perfectly, even when the boss gives it some gas, or should I say liquid. As the level drops towards empty, a flick of the switch returns the car to petrol power, so the LPG option gives the driver two tanks to choose from. They'll just have to find somewhere else to store the spare tyre. <laughs>